Step into the film industry and the world of film reviewing with this week's guest, Mark Naglatsis. Copywriter, film critic, editor, and now scriptwriter and public speaker, Mark talks in depth about his 20-year career as film editor for the West Australian newspaper. He shares some fun stories from this time and takes time to explain how he goes about actually reviewing films. In this conversation, we explore the development of film and the film industry, as well as insights into the Australian film industry itself. Mark provides a fascinating summary and commentary of the changing landscape of entertainment from the 70s to the present day, which I personally found provoking. It really made me think about the media that I've been consuming and how it's changed since I've grown up. What gives this conversation some real added depth is the very real honest share from Mark about the challenges and learnings of his transition of leaving a stable 20 year career job to move into his new focus on script writing. I was I found this part of the conversation absolutely fascinating and I learned a lot from it. I really enjoyed talking to Mark. He's super engaging and I know you are too. So enjoy Mark. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Journalism, film reviewing, and the creative world of arts and entertainment are just some of the things that we'll be exploring today with my guest, Mark Neglasses. Mark, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so one of the questions I always ask my guests at the start is their connection to Western Australia. Um, I came here nine years ago, other people move at different times, but you were born and bred I'm here. profoundly connected here. I was born in the uh, King Edward Hospital along with half the population of Western Australia. Although my connections, I guess, on one side of the family is a kind of, you know, the Scottish-Irish connection. My right. father is uh, Lithuanian, so I've got, I guess, one foot in Western Australia, another foot sort of in, you know, kind of post-war Europe. So, you know, mm. and, like, a lot. So, and I guess my mother was a bit unusual in marrying a, a foreigner, I guess, yeah. at that time, the 19... 19- how did they meet? Uh, oh, goodness. So he was, I think she was working in a, uh, no, she was working in a shoe store, I think, in the, in uh, Hay Street, I think. And my father was, uh, you know, chasing the ladies like they were doing back in the, you know, the late 1950s. And they hooked up and married quickly. And uh, yeah, so. And, and, Kapow, and, here you are. And stuck together for a long time. Um, tell me what it was like growing up in Western Australia for you. What are some of your abiding memories? It's interesting. I um, grew up in a, a very, very poor suburb, uh, Manning. It was a, uh, what they call a state housing commission area. It was very interesting back then. Now it's a kind of a, a fairly expensive middle class suburb, but it really yeah. was a very, very working class suburb. So we grew up on the streets, you know, it's almost like gang territory to some extent. And <laughs> I, it was fantastic. I loved it. I was a, a little, you know, I was as tough as the rest of the kids. We were running around with uh, take off at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and come back at, you know, five o'clock at night. We'd be going down to the river around uh, Como, those areas all around that area there so yeah it was a real kind of Tom Sawyer existence to some extent but a little yeah. kind of edgier and so I actually love that and it's I you know the kids today don't have anything like the sort of upbringing no. that we had it was a really kind of wild actually. It's interesting uh, talking to many people who born and bred in Western Australia you know the outdoors is a common feature of growing mm. up and also this freedom you know many stories of Oh yeah, well we left in the morning and we came back when we were hungry. Everyone said that, and uh, you know they've often do t- stories of the the Eric Edgar Cook back in the early sixties, the serial killer. You know when people started shutting their doors, but you know that I think that's a little bit of a myth. I think people mm. kept their doors pretty well open through the nineteen sixties. It was a very a very gentle place, and uh, yeah, we also had things like suburban football. You know, like we have the uh, AFL now, but it was Perth, Perth. You know, Perth seems smaller than it once was for some reason. Perth is really? many times bigger than it was when I was growing up. But it was more it was more compacted then. People were you know there was um, Saturday morning football games constantly. For instance, you go down there. There seemed to be people everywhere. People have been looking at pictures of the city in the 1950s and 60s and they can't believe how dense it looks because there was three or four streets and everyone was there. People dressed up in their best clothing to yeah. go to the city um, uh, you know, on a Friday night, took their families. It just felt different. Now we, I think we're much more of a, a Los Angeles sprawl now. So it's yes. a different kind of... so. You know, Garden City or, you know, the shopping centres would be more densely packed than, than the city. I, mean, I think it's a kind of a loss, actually. I kind of miss the mm. old Perth to some extent. Yeah. Would you class yourself as a proud West Australian? Or? I actually have grown to love Western Australia. I must admit that I was a bit of a a bit of a snotty uh, kid in my teens. I just wanted to get out and get... I went up to London yeah. when I was... Uh, 
uh, 6, 17 or 18, I can't remember, had to get out. You know, everything was better in, in, in the UK. Then nowadays kids go off to New York and then probably go to the UK yeah. as much. But, um, but it's, I've grown to love the place. I've grown to respect it much more and, and the beauty of the place. And um, I do dis- despair at some of our, not so much insularity, but I don't think we, I think the resources being pumped into things like sport you know, it does get a bit disappointing. You think, oh, God, you know, we, we at one level we have advanced, other levels we've kind of gone backwards. So, yes. there are, you know, Perth kind of fluctuates somewhat, and, and especially nowadays with the media, changes in the media, I come out of the media. Yeah. And, you know, it, it feels like a, a different landscape now. So, in some, some sense, my world, my world view is changed and altered by how I see it through the media. When I see the media diminish, the world kind of diminishes, but I'm not quite sure other people think the same, the same way. That's my kind of, you know, my media man's, you know, world to some yes. extent. So in your time, you've been film editor and senior critic for the West Australian. Um, you've now involved in script development, uh, doing some work, you know, movies with Mark. I do a lot of hosting nowadays. That seems like a little bit of reviewing on radio. So I've kept my foot in radio yeah. since leaving the West Australian. And yeah, I, I tried to, when I left the West about three years ago, I was hoping to branch into other areas, but even more the kind of corporate sort of world. And I thought, oh, God, I had worked in advertising back in the 1980s, and I thought, oh, I kind of have to reconnect with that world. And I come back, and that world is kind of, once again, like everything yeah. has changed. There barely is a world. And I didn't actually like, it didn't, it, it hasn't attracted me as much. And, and so I've kind of boomeranged back into the film world to some extent mm. through my own kind of shows and that kind of thing. I'm not really writing consistently like I did. So I couldn't, I wanted to leave, but I couldn't leave to some extent. So I kind of kept drawing yeah. back because it was my passion. It remains my passion. I guess when I consider the, you know, the Mark journey, there's, there's a strong sense of communication, creativity, writing that seems to be a consistent thing. Where does that focus come from in the Mark journey? That's a really, really interesting is that question. Role model, is it's it? funny. It's a, I've often thought back because I have a, a very unusual past in the sense that when I you know I grew up kind of in a very working class suburb, I got wrenched out of that suburb um, at a very young age. I think I was in grade five or six and sent to a private school on a scholarship. So I kind of got went from a, a working class and you know, just got wrenched straight into that world. How did that come about? Um, well, it was because my father, who was a, um, a Lithuanian immigrant, was working at a place called Aquinas College, uh, the big school, right. uh, which wasn't quite as fancy back then. And the, the Christian brothers running the school um, gave, said, you can come to the school for free. you know. And I went to Aquinas College for free because my father worked there as a tradesman. And it was a very generous thing. I don't know if that kind of thing would happen today. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I must admit that when I first went to Aquinas, I, was, I spent a year kind of on the margins. What, what the hell am I doing here? And I've got rich people all around me and I'm this little working class kid. And, uh, and I did very much what working class people have done in those situations throughout history, uh, throughout the 20th century. I got good at sport. Mm. And I became a sports champion. So people now know me as the, the film guy. But if you have known me in the mid-70s, it was it was the running man. You know, So I yeah. ran and I ran and I ran. I was a, a state champion. I was the chase state champion sprinter all through my teenage years. And, and so I had a great sporting emphasis. But I don't know. But at the same time, I, I, was, I think I was developing an interest in particularly in popular culture, which was hard in Perth in the 70s. That really didn't exist. I started watching movies and... Uh, I think my mother loved movies. I used to sit down right. and watch movies, black and white movies on television in the in the 1960s when I was three or four or five years age. And I grew up, I remember sitting there watching old Hollywood movies. And it kind of was always in the background of my family. They do tell me my grandfather was a tap dancer, so there might be a bit of that in there. And so I developed both of these kind of, you know, an arts interest and a sporting interest. And that's, it's been a kind of a, um, it's always been at me the whole time. You know, I'm, I'm sort of... Um, uh, I've had both of those kind of patients. I'm, I'm not. I'm not interested in sport so much as a spectator. I always enjoyed doing sport as a bit of a doer, and so that that need to do something, that need to be um, someone that didn't just watch footballers play, but played football or whatever. Mm. That interest in the arts has probably pushed me towards wanting to be the person creating something now. So I think a certain kinds of psychological instincts are sort of coming to mm. the fore now in my late in, unfortunately i've left it until very late to very late years so i'm a real late starter in that kind mm. of creative space so tell me about the journey to become uh, to get into journalism it yeah went, that's a, that's an interesting again that's an interesting uh, journey as well i mean i i've had you know especially in my t- 20s i had um a lot of 
pulled and uh, being torn and thrown. So through my early, uh, late teens and early 20s, I was a bit of an itinerant. I was, it, it, what happened in, it's this very interesting story, in, 19, uh, in the 1970s, Gough Whitlam made um, education free. So kids back in that age were, they would travel for a year, study for a year, travel for a year, study for a year. It didn't, they didn't have that sort of pressure. We had a, anyone that was at university in the 70s had a fantastic time. Mm. There was no pressure on careers. It was just pure education. It was an exciting time. The, the Whitlam years were incredibly exciting. So, you know, I'd study a bit of this. I'd study a bit of film, a bit of literature. Then I'd go to, I lived in London for a year. And I, I think I watched theatre for nonstop for, for 12 months. <laughs> and that was a great time in the late 70s. I think uh, punk rock was around, Thatcher was around, all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, and when I came back in the in the eighties, early eighties, I married very very quickly. So I I was only twenty four when I married, and and so I was again torn between you know wanting to continue studying. I was enjoying all the kind of fruits of studies, as well as needing a job. So that led me towards advertising. It was the only thing I could think of doing. So right. I became a, a copywriter. I had about three or four years as a copywriter in the mid nineteen eighties. Um, I was never quite happy there. You know, the other thing I was getting a bit interested in left wing politics, and I was right. the, I was the lefty, and I'd go into the you know into the ad agencies, and I was kind of you know you know sort of a bit annoyed at what I was actually doing. So I was kind of creative, not quite creative. So I was a bit of a tormented figure through the nineteen eighties. Uh, my wife uh, Isabel was born. She's Spanish, Spanish born. But was uh, not that she was actually born in in Canada, and mm. so we used her passport to with my son and her. And we went off to Barcelona for six months, and then we went off to um, to Toronto. Right. And while I was in Toronto, I started working reading film scripts. I was become a script reader, as they do in Hollywood. You know, you'd read the script and make assessments, and mm. that was a fantastic time. I was just sitting at home reading movie scripts and I making enough. That job just. It wasn't really a job. It was like a freelance thing, right. and and I was and I was pretty good at it. So I was good at. Um, analysis script analysis and they liked the way i wrote and i'd I'd write script reports and they'd pay me and whatever and uh and when i came back in the early 90s um i bumped into friends that were working at the west australian newspaper and i um, they i started writing freelance film reviews for them i'd always had this kind of interest a little bit uh, even through university years and i eventually I, i was writing for a couple of years as a as a a contributor and then um a gap opened up and i got a job there so that was the uh, it was a moment in time in which the newspaper mm. opened its arms to specialists to right. come in, and it was just a, a fantastic moment. I don't think it would, was ever repeated and right. never would happen again. There was no, what do you call apprenticeships or nothing like that. I didn't have to do a cadetship, nothing like that. I just went straight in as a senior writer. And I remember the very first, uh, the very first day, um, Ron Banks, who was the editor for the West, the arts editor for the West Australian, was going on holidays. I think two days later, I was brought into it to, to be his offside or to replace him. And they stepped me in front of a machine I had no idea how to use, a big old-fashioned uh, <clears throat> typing machine and printing machine. And they said to me, Mark, um, it's, it's easy. We, you get one um, arts page a day to fill up. It's in black and white. So in those days, if color would take a lot longer. It was just black and white. Uh, you just get it done by 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. And then for the next six weeks, I was getting two empty arts pages, sometimes three, uh, with full colour almost every day, so yeah. like a, a baptism of fire. I just kind of <laughs> landed in, and it was fantastic. I had great people around me. So I landed in advert- in journalism at the, I guess, the tail end of what you would know as that traditional journalism, you know, where all the Ed Stubbs sitting around with cigarettes and putting stopping them out on yes. the desk and uh, people sitting around piles of newspapers. So I got a little taste of the old world of journalism, and I had a fantastic run of 10, 20 years and then by the end, it really, you know, the digital revolution had mm. come and um, that's where I could see in my, you know, that it was time to leave. But I had, I, had a, I had an absolutely exhilarating time as a journalist. Mm. I, um, yeah, I interviewed all the great... I was going to say, you, during that time you got to interview some fascinating people. Every movie star in the world. I travelled to film festivals. I was on the phone constantly, yeah, to the film stars, you know, I... Um, I was at the ringside seat with the passing of Heath Ledger. It was a big, one of the biggest news stories yes. that uh, we had ever had here in Western Australia. I, um, Didn't he leave you a message? Or oh, yeah, it was a very famous little well, moment there when Heath, I think two or three weeks before he died, he left a, a phone message saying that um, he was looking forward to coming back and talking to me about The Joker, the new film that he'd just done. And, uh, yeah. and the, that message, uh, we, we reprinted it, I think, and people, the whole world wanted that message. Unfortunately, I, uh, I think I erased it, and, yeah. <laughs> and so it became this kind of hunt for the message but it was a fascinating time there's, there's, there's yeah. another whole podcast on, on the passing of Heath it was a moment yeah. of 
global celebrity hitting Perth and his funeral. It was a most extraordinary. Mm. It was an exhilarating time as a journalist as well. I mean, I remember the very first story that I had to write on Heath's passing. I think Lucy might have, uh, Lucy Gibson, uh, that we both know well, might have been there My as well. Fiance, yeah. My fiance, um, Where they had, we, uh, I was in charge of about 15 journalists who all had to feed me information. I sat there with everyone saying, this happened in like that sort yeah. of, you know, control centre. So it was an exhilarating moment yeah. of, of, in time, of, um, of the passing of Heath. But no, I, I had interviews with everybody, you know, from Anthony Hopkins to Cameron Diaz mm. to Robin Williams was particularly well, so special. Was most fun. Robin Williams was really interesting because uh, Robin, um, I went across to Sydney and not only did we interviews, we watched his film, I think called Bicentennial Man, but he was testing out his new stand-up show and he took a, a small group of journalists um, and my wife was with me to a little club and he, for two, you know, an hour and a half he just sat there and tested out his new material. So I had a, a front row with wow. Robin you know, at the exhilarating best and it was the most extraordinary you know, couple of hours of, of genius that I, I'd ever watched in my life. So I have great fond memories of Robin mm. Williams later and uh, but yeah so yeah all of those guys lots of film directors um so yeah you know th- you know dozens and dozens of people I saw thousands of movies i wrote stories about everything so it was just mm. a really fantastic time so fantastic that when i quit it was a bit like a junkie you know trying to come down it took me ages to yeah. sort of get off that kind of wheel of work and 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 because it was just fantastic and mm. um, it, it doesn't really exist today because newspapers are not like they were today they're a pale shadow of one day well once... we'll come to that in a minute yeah so obviously you're, you're seeing all these films and, and you're doing all the interviews what um how does one go about reviewing critiquing a film that's very interesting, and you know, I I always had this kind of rule. Um, I never wanted to tell filmmakers to give me the film that I wanted. I always tried to understand what they were attempting to do, mm. and then to see how well they they did their own thing. You know, because yeah. there's a lot of genres that I don't like. I don't like horror films very much, for instance. Yeah. But I always said, right now, what? How good is it on its own terms? I want to find out what those terms are. And that's really the principle I've always used. I never want to tell lecture people. When I came to write, I was also somebody that was kind of open and generous. I know people have said I had a bad reputation for hammering Australian movies or whatever, but I probably was a little bit hard. But what I always wanted to do was to never turn people off a movie. In other words, I, even though, no matter how bad it was, I always wanted people to go along to the movie. You know, I mm. wanted them to go along and experience it themselves. I, didn't, I, never, I remember an art critic that we had here in Perth was... You almost made people sound stupid if they wanted to go along and see something or, or thought something. I never, I, I've never disputed other people's views. It's completely subjective, and so yeah. all I would do was describe it as best I could, give some insights into what what I thought the theme or the meaning of the yeah. film might be, and um, and 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 so I I've always seen myself as somebody on the side of the artists. I've never seen myself as an imperious critic. That's just right. sort of. You know, judging people and, judging, and judging, judging. yeah, no, I'm not never been judgy, judgy. I've always wanted to fight, be on their side because I know how hard it is. And mm. and you know, the more I've been trying myself to write, the more I realise how hard it is and how mm, difficult. I was going to ask you about this in a bit. Yeah, huge challenges, and and that's just that's just what I would call the creative side of it. And there's now the marketing side of it, and you know, we could again do another whole podcast on the transformation of cinema because it's it, it it's it's the same as the transformation of the media in general mm. audiences we're living through an enormous enormous time of social political cultural transformation has landed on movies and that's what i'm kind of finding myself in the middle of mm. because yeah i mean i wanted to ask that question because yeah f- films are just so subjective and you know one man's wine is another man's poison absolutely and um is it a case that after a period of time that people sort of say, oh, I like Mark's reviews, they reflect my yeah, views, that, yeah. so I'm going to follow him. And and, and, but, and the opposite as well, that I and, hate Mark's yeah, yeah. reviews, therefore whatever he says, I'm going to go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had, I've had <laughs> he a says it's crap, I'm going to love it. <laughs> yeah, 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 so there's always been that, um, you know, you, you've got that kind of relationship. So you don't want to be a wimp when you review either. When I say I want to be open no. and generous, you don't want to be sort of saying, you know, oh, everything's good. Mm. You've still got to be strong, but I think insightful. Um 
so it's that combination of, I think it's that kind of open spirit generosity. Um, I've also been somebody that likes a bit of humour in reviewing. I, you know, there's nothing like reading something that's kind of funny, um, be it a good review or a bad review, a certain kind of wit, a, wit, a certain playfulness. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of people like Anthony Lane, who's the critic for The New Yorker, a, probably the premier critic. And one of them, he's not, maybe not the best critic, but he's certainly the best writer. Yeah. You know, so it's a piece, I've always thought reviewing is a piece of writing as well, which is what I think in a sense, pushed me away from the newspaper towards the end because, you know, I was getting 700 words to, to write a review or mm. 800 words or whatever I was given. They're going down to 300 words, 200 words. In other words, they're little tiny pocket mm. reviews now. So they're not pieces of writing as they once were. They're just kind of opinions now. So yes. and I find that much, a little bit less interesting. But people are not reading. That's another question. Do they want to read things as long? Mm. You know, I'm finding now I write um, a little reviews on Facebook and I wrote something recently about the film called The Nightingale, which was a oh, very yeah. controversial I've film. a lot of it. And then I, you know, looked up and there's hundreds of people all, yeah, they're great, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, right? And that was a four paragraph review and I have more response from that little review on Facebook than I had for my film reviews towards the end being in the newspaper. <laughs> and I thought, and so... The, again, as you know, the world has the world has changed, you know. So um, mm. that people are interested in the four the four line review now, and and the skill to that kind of thing, I guess. As yeah, well, super you know, condensed, like Twitter or something like that. So you've got to be very agile in the in the in the film, what I call the cultural criticism world now. You know, that's another whole space. But we can talk about. Hmm. How. Um... How difficult, sensitive, precarious is it to review Australian films, particularly West Australian Absolutely. films? Absolutely, it's, 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 it's a in Western Australia. It's a terrible thing, and to some extent, I'm, 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 I don't really consider myself a reviewer now. It's a bit more of a occasional commentator because I'm trying to work in that area. There, I'm not going to start um, slamming the work of you know potential producers, potential colleagues. Mm. I had a very interesting story many, many years ago, and I was sort of in my, the early stages of review. I um, uh, I saw a particular film, and I um, just you know, really hated the film. And they'd actually asked me to interview the director, and I said, "Okay, what I'll do is separate the review from the interview. So I will allow a. Uh, in fact, they were offering to fly me to Sydney for to an interview. I thought it'd be great. And I said, "Look, I'll get um, Ron Banks, who was the arts editor at the time, to review the film. So he's so it's separate. So I will do the interview. So my I won't." Um, how should I say, uh, confuse the two mm. positions. I'm not going to anger the guy. Um, then I, and, and then Ron Banks said to me, no, no, I haven't got time. He changed his mind at the last minute. So I had to give this film and I, I gave it a good, honest, you know, tough review. And then the next day, my interview, my, my trip to Sydney to fly and to meet the director was cancelled. <laughs> and they do take it very personally. We have a very small industry here in Australia, mm. particularly back then, not so much now where there's many more bloggers and many more writers, but, you know, back in the in my day, there might have been six or seven influential critics around the country. You know, it was me in Perth, a couple of guys in Sydney, a couple of guys in Melbourne, and that was kind of it. And so mm. they knew everything that was going on. And we were influential back then. We're not influential now. The critics aren't influential now, not like they in once what were. Way? Well, um, an old media was ascendant um, here in Perth. The Western Australian was very influential. You know, I could make or break films at, when I was in my kind of heyday. Uh, nowadays, um, the internet has opened up to the world, so there's mm. reviews everywhere. There's uh, So no review. The only reviewers that have any sort of, I think, major potency maybe is some of the what I call trade reviewers that go to film festivals that might set the agenda with their first review. Variety will see something at the Toronto Film Festival, give it a negative review, and you, it kind of... It starts the kind of ball rolling. Perfectly. And also reviews now, it's a more of an aggregated position. So it's not one review that's influential, but it's the it's the you know, the sixty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes, it's the what do you call the review aggregated. The, aggregation. More, the the wisdom of the crowds to some extent. So, you know, that kind mm. of power is not there. So certain there are some powerful people, the Guardian, for instance, you know, or the New York Times perhaps. But I'm not even convinced that they're um, important anymore. I think we're in a completely different space and what why films succeed and why they don't succeed is now not really dependent on film critics. They depend on other other kinds of factors, and that's Such extremely as. complex. Oh, you know, I think movie stars are once again more potent than they once were. You know, the um, particularly some of the um, the older stars, your Helen Mirren's and your Judy Dench's, 
they're incredibly there is you know if I was making a movie I'd, I'd have Judy Dench as much as I'd have Matt Damon in a movie mm. if you're making a film for that kind of older crowd you know the other thing that's very important now is that the only people who see movies outside of the multiplexes are a much older audience so mm. and this is a very important point when I began reviewing in the early 90s I was already over 30 I was a bit of I was a late starter uh, and I thought well, I'm not going to have long I'm not going to last long in this business because all the 25 years around 25 year olds and 20 year olds around me are not going to be interested to hear what I've got to say in the space of the two two and a half decades that I was reviewing those the audience not only had caught up to my age they actually surpassed so by the end of my time as a reviewer you know I, I was in my late 50s most of the audience were in their 60s and 70s. So they'd actually gone ahead of me. It was most extraordinary. Yes. That's been the big transformation in film is that the core audience today for what I would call non-multiplex movies are older people and mostly older women. Right. And the film industry is just gradually waking up to that fact. And, uh, and so they're starting to put less money into zombie movies and more money into movies aimed at that kind of older crowd you know so mm. and it's but i still don't believe that the but that's happening across the board in culture in general but so film how, is, this raises an interesting point then so from a business point of view if it is the the more elderly ladies who are the ones that are going to see the non-multiplex movies do you make more movies aimed at them because it is on one level of business and that's but, then, but then, on the other level, if you recognise that it's becoming that isolated, um, how do you spread it out? Exactly, and 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 can you sustain a, and that's... can you sustain a business model on? Um, yeah, that's the dynamic. You know, the, 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 the old, the old and will the, will the crowd in their forties? My feeling is that the forty year olds and thirty year olds are watching Netflix, with home with the kids. Yeah, will they eventually, uh, when the kids grow up, want to go out? To movies because you know they one thing with movies is that, that people recognize you can't sit at home forever you do need to go out occasionally yes and they are going out you know the movies and and people like helen mirren as i say are, are queens of the box office at the moment and certainly you know i've just uh, been talking to universal pictures about a um, uh, a fund in which they're they're looking for screenplays and it's they simply they wrote a little list they want movies for women over the age of 45 is actually sitting there and they and they don't have many of those because you know why that is is because most people that are dynamic in the film industry or are kind of striving to build you know to make themselves are men and women in their 20s and early 30s and mm. you know um the, you know looking at the lives of old people they might be looking at you know films about ballet in the 17th century it's so far removed from them to some extent not entirely some can reach that so it's a quite a challenge to um uh, to entertain that group, but I, I don't. You know, I've got certain ideas why they're not doing that. It's also a challenge now for marketers as well. You know, mm. like Lucy, um, your fiance, is how do you reach? You know, the, they're struggling to reach younger people. So when they do get those films aimed at younger people, um, what do they do? How do they reach them? You know, the mm. internet's so so massive. They can still, funny enough, they can still reach that older crowd because they still read newspapers. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's still a function of less and less, and that's changing oh, too. Really? So all again, we're in a in a in a, an era of flux, and uh, and anyone involved in the entertainment communication industry has to be extremely canny and quick moving and and quick thinking. But sometimes it's not always forward thinking. Sometimes I believe you need to go back and look at how things were done. You know, like. Uh, why were people watching so many movies in the nineteen fifties? You know, why why do we still watch Casablanca? Why do we what are those stories? Why do they still touch us? You know, so not always mm. I don't believe the solution's always out in the future. I think sometimes the solutions can be found mm. in history. What in, was going on in the depths of the script and the stories. And if you understand how those stories work, you know, why why do those sort of things work, you know? And of course the other big phenomenon now and that's probably again outside the scope of this um this is the rise of television. I spent a year as a TV critic or two years in the, I think, the early 2000s when in the golden age was beginning. I was writing about The Sopranos and those kinds of shows um, mm. and The West Wing, and that was a fascinating time, but that just exploded, you know. So, uh, again, movies don't have that centrality to the culture that they once did. The television has certainly taken that over. Yes. And we don't even know how big a screen's going to become, you know, with our... Once the, your TV screen's as big as a, you know, almost a movie screen, then what's going to happen then? So, it, you know, they now don't even call these things movies. They call it content. So it's got a different name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and how does 
yeah and how does movies and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound like an old man now uh, and how do movies compete when you, you've got tons and tons of reality TV now I mean, tons, tons of everything. Everything. So, so everything you Even know. programs about people watching TV. I know, that's just obscene, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... And so, you know, these are uh, these are questions that I'm asking myself as somebody that's dabbling in the uh, the script writing area. What kind of films can I sell to producers and what you know to government who fund the film industry, you know, here in Australia mm. it's like the government funded film industry. So what what do you do? You know, what sort of stories do you find? And and they are looking at and they're thinking, well, we need stories that are that give us other worlds. You know, um, Australia in the nineteen fifties, for instance, or take us somewhere, take us somewhere we haven't been before. Because I'm not quite sure the small domestic drama will play very well on the big screen as it once did, because people see it every day on their on their televisions. Yes, they want to be, they want to go somewhere. Top end wedding, for instance, is, you know the the dressmaker. You know, they take us to other worlds. Uh, and and to some extent, that's again not a dissimilar problem to the 1950s when television first arrived. You know, as the TV screen started to enter our homes, uh, Hollywood had to respond by making you know Cinerama and widescreen and Cinemascope. So films got bigger and bigger in the 1950s and 60s. You know, uh, Cleopatra and all of those kinds of films. Mm. The, the sword and sandal epic grew out of the arrival of television. And to some extent, the same thing is happening now. Marvel movies are getting bigger and bigger. Yes. Um, they're having to compete against the small screen. Although that's almost becoming artificial now because the same people who own the big screens own the small screens as companies like Disney yes. gobble it all up and then possibly narrow down the content. So these are, mm. again, you know, we're living in an age of enormous, as I say, shift, complaint, con- con- you know, people are contesting all of this. So, you know, anyone who's got a young... It strikes me that... It strikes me that yes, on one level we are dealing with you know, amazing change. You know, you can have a Netflix and a Stan account, and and you're away, and you know your access to movies is huge. However, it then becomes this: you know, you watch what's on Netflix and Stan, and and you're going to one source, one one or two sources, and then they're telling you what you're. The algorithms are guiding the algorithms towards, are are guiding you yeah. towards it, yeah. And um, yeah, I think I've got quite sensitive to this recently. Um, in that, sometimes you just want that something, and it's just not quite there. It, there's everything, but nothing. It's, it's, it's almost like a uh, yeah, it's, and it, it's almost like the smorgasbord lunch at the at the hotel on holiday, which is great for the first two or three days, and then you're bored by day four, five, and six. Yes, people have complained about that, and and in the US, I think it's quite cheap to get your uh, online sources. So people have five and six accounts, and have Netflix, and have another, you mm. know, and all the and the other thing is all the big um, players like Apple are starting to move into this space as well. Disney are about mm. to launch a um, a channel as well, so that's going to expand and expand, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, how much good content can there be? Yeah. I, I actually do think there is too much content. I mean, I mean, it's a stupid thing to say, but I would rather there be less and better. You know, mm. absolutely. Mm. Um, I, I grew up with four channels on the TV: <laughs> BBC One and Two, ITV, yeah. and Channel Four when I was about ten. <laughs> yeah, and you, you know what's what's another great loss to all of this, uh, Bryn, is that there was I, I'm a great there was once what they call like a, a great common culture that you and I could sit down and talk about a TV show that we watched last night. Yes. The chances of two people being able to talk about something they watched last night are almost nothing now because everyone's got their own um, mm. channels. Two ships own. in the dark. Two if sh- we yeah. did just happen there's to have very little. The there's very little uh, ability to even talk about things. And you know, the other thing that's doing that as well is because people are watching things um, at different times, mm. it means nobody wants to, you know, the spoiler alert phenomenon and I've never, uh, to me, the culture has never been less interesting as it is right now because nobody can talk about anything because no one's seen, any, you know, there'll be three people in a room who've seen the new episode of Game of Thrones and not the fourth and fifth. And also oh, you can't talk about it, so we have to shut up about that. So this constant mm. having to shut up. So we've got this thing called television that I never really know what TV shows are about until I watch them because no one can talk about them. Yeah. So I find the conversation to be very, very, very uninteresting, mm. you know, because you can never find two people who have ever seen the same thing. Yes, you know, as opposed a... to episode three came out last night at seven o'clock and we all watched it or yeah. taped it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and, and I'm a great, I, know, I mean, I'm a child of the 70s in film mm. terms and the films that really impacted me were films about The Godfather. 
Mm. You know, that's almost the perfect film for me because it's it's an, a work of art, mm. and a lot of people saw it. You know, mm. like the massive audience, um, and, I th- and that's once in a you know it doesn't happen anymore. You don't actually you know you occasionally you'll see it. Um, but g- very generally, you'll have your art movies on one side, you'll have your pop movies on another side there, and nothing comes together. You know, so, that, so I'm a great lover of what I would call that those classic Hollywood, maybe even going back further, Alfred Hitchcock, people like that, yes. where the works that are popular are also works of art. Yes. And you don't see that very often. And you do see it now, it's around comic book movies, you know, the Joker that's coming out, I think, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, you know, but you know, they can't, I'm not. I do get a bit irritated when in the great works of art are still comic book comic book movies. Yeah, you know, and that's that's kind of where it's at a bit at the moment. There, so I do crave that sort of um, the seventies. You know, again, we could do another whole po- podcast in the nineteen seventies. <laughs> I've done my, I've done shows on this myself, and the seventies to me are the kind of golden age of it's when I came of age in the, you know, and that, that's what I that's the, and you know one thing we didn't actually talk about is why I got so interested in movies is because movies for people of my generation were sex. Yeah. Like literature, books and movies were sex. You know, we didn't have access to, I mean, I was young at the time, but in other words, it's where sensuality or sexuality entered the culture in right. a huge way in, in the 70s, in the 60s. And, you know, um, it was that unleashing. And so, you know, sexual liberation then imprints itself on, on films particularly. Yes. And in the 70s in Australia, the R-rated movie came in for the first time and... You know, I'm going to reveal on microphone here that I was sneaking into those at the age of 15, you know, <laughs> they're under 17, and we'd pretend we'd rattle car keys. And, uh, and other, you know, so I saw all the sort of shockers of the 70s as a 15 year old, and which really shows you probably where the culture has shifted somewhat, hasn't it? That, you know, if, you, if, if the average 15 year old today, I remember coming home and telling my mother all about the last tango in Paris when I was 15, and she was saying, Yes, dear, that's nice, dear. And imagine a mother today if they'd been revealed. <laughs> A kid have been off seeing R-rated movies yeah. at fifteen, you know, because they're seeing Harry Potter now. Mm. And so, again, so my generation was one of endless curiosity about mm. um, the world, music, drugs, sexuality, all of those sorts of things. That's nowadays. Well, it's it's different, you know. We, um, you know, in one some ways it's different. They they have easy access to things like drugs. I guess there's porn on the internet as well. So it's a Again, you know, all this is far too complicated for a, for a podcast, yeah. I think, Brent. Yeah, but you can see. see yeah. right. Where do you look to at the moment for, like, the industry standards for film? Oh, for my own guidance to watch stuff? Yeah. Uh, look, um, I actually have become quite sick of film reviews. They don't interest me very much anymore. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm a bit of a whinger here at the moment because I think that um, what's happened in the last three years since I've kind of left full-time reviewing that the world of culture has become highly politicised. Mm. We're living in a, a very um, tense political moment in the Me Too movement, the questions of race in America, of privilege, all of those things. And it's great that those things have come up, and I've got no problem with um, all of these issues, but they've, they're now starting to land on top of things like film reviewing. And I'm reading reviews of films, and I can't even work out if a film is any good or not because I can't. Not just that, I can't even work out where the art of the film is. So I'm looking around, that I'm finding interesting discussions about who's been cast in a movie, a black person, a white person, questions of sexuality, gender, and all of those issues. But I still can't work out, you know, what what I'm actually watching. And yeah. uh, and and recently, I had the experience of writing a a, a Facebook post on the film The Nightingale, mm. and I think we just mentioned it got. Um, hundreds of hits because it's a very interesting film because it's a film that's got rave reviews it's considered probably the best australian film for 20 years maybe mm. you know and and yet i was reading the reviews and all i kept saying it was that such a harrowing experience the 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 five star reviews were actually driving me away from the film and i felt a bit sorry for the filmmaker i think oh my god you, you've made a masterpiece and people yet people are, are driving you away from the film because of all the sensitivity issues around the film yes. you know the um violence the the sexual violence the yes. uh, the various issues within it and i couldn't see the film and then i went along you know i was the last person to see it because again i was pushed away from seeing the yeah. film by the reviews and i saw a cracking good film i thought wow mm. what an amazing film this was it was a a great story of black white coming together surviving <clears> in this terrible time in tasmania in the 1820s and and you know what it was i really saw it certainly that, took you there i went to see it amazing film and and yet the reviews were pushing me away because they'd become so hypersensitive to all you know they were trigger warning warning we don't go see this film oh, you might be warning. 
and this whole thing became intense. And, and so I wrote a Facebook post. It got a great response. And I held a little screening of it. And we had a, six or seven people come along to it who loved the movie. And so it was a real nutshell of what I'm seeing in films today. I'm seeing not a discussion of the art of film, of story, of character. I'm seeing all kinds of other things around films mm. and all the political stuff. So, uh, and, and that's combined with my own... It wasn't diverse. It triggered me... This, yeah. yeah, and it's also combined. I think it's a bit of that plus my own particular passion at the moment, which is screenwriting, and they're the issues that you're dealing with. You know, when you're a screenwriter, you're probably not going to be dealing so much with what I would call all the the cultural accoutrements. You're so you're so busy trying to make a story work. Hmm. You know, character goes made to be. How does he do that? What stops him? In other words, so being a, a kind of a so I'm probably now approaching film from what I would call like a carpenter. Like a I sit there and watch movies now, and I with a clock. I have a stopwatch and say, well, this happened and. 30, you know, 15 minutes in. Yes. That happens at 20 minutes in. So I'm actually watching more like a, um, yeah, like a mechanic. Or Deconstructing it. Yeah. Deconstructing it, but not in an intellectual fashion, just simply... In a craft a, way. Craft. So I'm, I'm mm. very interested in film craft now. So, um, yeah, so that's where my passions have lined. You know, I'm mm. trying to hang on to the kind of what I call the cultural sort of side of it, but I'm really much more interested in the craft side of it now. So why did you leave the West? Well, um, I probably it was more that I could see the end of old media coming, and uh, mm. I took, you know they were offering a very generous redundancy. Plus, I was hitting a certain age where I said, "Look, if I'm ever going to do any creative work, I should do it now." Mm. You know, this was the moment my children had grown up. You know, I was kind of safe, you know, financially, and so I just took a bit of a plunge. I was also looking to diversify a little bit in the sense that I had spent twenty, twenty-five years as a journalist, and I wanted to try some different things. You know, apart from my creative work, so I kind of just. I, I took a kind of a mad, fairly stupid sort of, you know, late life kind of jump away. I probably could have quite happily sat there for a few years. However, mm. as as I've watched the, the newspaper over the last three to four years, say three years, two years, I probably wouldn't have stayed there much longer anyway because, you know, each day or each month another set of redundancies were announced, <laughs> forced and, un, you know, unenforced and they're kind of pushing people away. So I probably, I don't know that I would have even been uh, able to sort of hang on there because it's a very small newspaper now and, you know, we had a very indulgent arts department. There was seven, eight, ten of us writing about arts and, and, and music and those kinds of stuff. There's a couple of guys that are still left doing it. But, um, but it was really, I, yeah, it was a bit of a shock. It was a number of issues. It was like as if the... I didn't really want to be the last one there turning out the lights. Yeah. I wanted to see some other opportunities. I just wanted to... Was there yeah. a bit of um, having spent so many years watching movies and, and seeing other people's creative works? Exactly. It's time for me to put Have myself out there. Yeah, it was that, a lot of that. And and I'd begun, as I say, as a creative copywriter in, mm. in the 80s. So I always had this... Mm you know, creative urge. And I'd written a, sc a film script that we got some sub support back in the early 90s. I... <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. You're right. Sorry. Um, I had been, I'd written a couple of scripts just in pa in passing. In, um... <coughs> Sorry. I'd written a couple of scripts in passing um, in between writing, but I re quickly discovered that you really, it's something to be devoted to. It's not something you can take two weeks off to write yeah. or write at night or something like that. So it's I really, opus. <laughs> I needed to really throw myself into it. And, uh, and you know, and it has been a an incredible, incredible journey for the last couple of years of doing this. I, I found support from the government for a script that I wrote when I within a month of leaving the West Australian, I got a producer, got a director. Then, the, then the hard work started, and I was working as script editor. And I thought, oh my god, it's it's a lot. It, at one level, I leapt um, too far forward too quickly. I needed to, but there's no right, there's no right and wrong no. way into into doing this. You know, some people go slowly, some go fast, and. Uh, the last year has been very interesting. I, I said, stop, I'm not going to write anymore. I'm going to think. So I spent the last year basically um, reading books on how to write a script. I actually right. went to script writing manuals. It sounds um, kind of um, daggy and mechanical. But, you know, particularly in America, the script, script writing is a massive, it's a craft. It's um, hundreds yeah. and hundreds of books. And there's school teachers. It's schools writing, you know, as you can study these things. So I did a kind of a, a deep dive into into the theory of writing. And uh, and that's starting to pay a few dividends. I'm starting to get a kind of a, a clarity now on how to approach things. So I'm feeling, mm -hmm. you know, and the other thing is that I've slowed down. You know, when I was a, a you know, when you're a journalist, you um, you get up in the morning and because I was a critic, 
I'd get up in the morning, I'd start my review at 8 o'clock, I'd finish it by 12 o'clock, and I was done for the day. And I wrote very quickly, um, you know, 800 or 100,000 words or whatever, and uh, I'd get my work done. And so when you sit down to write a film script, um, I had the same kind of urgency. I said, right, I'll get this done. You know, two weeks later, I'll get this, <laughs> I'll get this <laughs> done. And what's absurd, uh, Bryn, is that I actually did write an entire 100-page screenplay in the space of two weeks. <laughs> Because I had the same level of kind of drive and energy that I had as a journalist. And and that was great. It actually, funny enough, it actually received government support. Somebody liked it well enough to support it. And then I had to work on it and I had to retrofit it because it was so badly constructed and so badly built. And I thought, oh, my God, I should never have done that. I, so I'm now, I've slowed right down. Mm. I, don't, I don't sprint like I used to. You know, I had the old... I was the old sprinter from the school days. I was, that's how I approached writing. And so I've slowed myself right down. So I think I'm hitting a stage now where I'm getting a little bit of my, my natural speed or my natural urgency and it's marrying a little bit with, um, I think, a newfound thoughtfulness. of like slow down a little mm. bit, you know. Um, and yes. Yeah, so. it must have been quite a transition to go from 20 years being known as Mark the Film Editor at the West and... and even doing something for 20 years, you know, you get into a pattern, you know, exactly, you do yeah. the thing, it becomes, you know, it, it's a part of your identity. Absolutely. And then to walk away from that and to do something very different. Yeah, and that was the shock. I didn't quite realise. I thought I could handle it quite easily, but I, I, I didn't handle it very well at all. I said, oh my God, I, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, people won't take my phone calls. You know, that, you know, when you're when I was a journalist, everyone took, you know, Mark, Mark, you know, to pick the phone call up. And you become a bit of a non-entity to some extent. And, mm. uh, and yeah, I kind of, I, I did lose that. And, and what's really been interesting, Bryn, is, is that at one level in taking a redundancy, it was a bit like facing early retirement. I mm. could really understand what men who re- men and women who retire go through. And I've been reading a bit about that. And it can, you know, people really do, it's a real shock to the system. So it was like an early sh- look at what retirement would be. And, and one of the reasons why I did leave was that I wanted to actually lay out a future for myself that I could see into my later years that I wanted yes. to I could see my I couldn't see myself going to a new it wouldn't even exist in newspapers so I needed to set up something that would interest me in coming years and that's what I was kind of on a path and it hasn't happened very quickly at all you know and um, uh, it's been going in fits and starts you know and and uh, uh, and yes, and, and to some extent, what's been interesting for me is that some of the scripts that I was writing or working on are actually almost about myself going through those very situations and, you know, that art life sort of thing. And I'm mm. very interested in um, transition, you know, what do people do? And it's a, it's a huge subject today because it's not just somebody, it's not just a 60-year-old facing transition or a 55-year-old. No. 30 30-year-olds face transitions, our 35-year-old, 40-year-olds, we're in an age of transition. What happens when the very thing that you trained as disappears. What happens yeah. to the very thing that you're good at? Sports people are interested, aren't they? What happens to the sports person who... Yeah, once they've finished. And they're they retired, finish there. Or they get an injury when they're... Mm. Imagine those guys that get injured. I, I think it must be the most tragic thing of all mm. is a, the 22-year-old footballer who can't play again. It must tear the souls out to some extent. And, and yeah, I mean, through, through doing this podcast, you know, I've sat down with over 100 people now and listened to their life stories and often in there it's not a linear path it's it's full of complexities and contradictions it's very circular it can go round and round and round and can and repeat itself until certain things are learned and you know i've had certainly recently i've had a number of people who've almost taken on things in their childhood that you know like dad or Mm. uncle or somebody that they looked up to said and then they've just run that over and over and over and over again, you know, well into their 30s or early 40s until such time as it's, it doesn't quite give them what they need anymore. That and kind of problem, Things yeah. break down and it's mm. letting go of that old story, letting go of that old identity. And then that can be confronting because then you're left in the abyss of the unknown. With nothing, yes, indeed. So all of these questions, and at my age, at my, my last year, my mother passed away quite suddenly. And, and so that's opened something else up. And uh, and all of these, you know, uh, so, you know, we're going through transitions, you know, children grow up. So it's the natural state of man is loss. And it's something that interests me as a writer very much. And I'm working on a particular project that deals with that very question. What does somebody do when they lose 
the very thing that that defines them and it's a subject yes. that really really interests me so mm. and so again so what's been interesting is that where i felt the last three years have been really quite tough for me because i've tried to, i've done a few different things i've been successful in some things i've tried a few different things um these the very issues that i'm actually going through are the very issue they're, they're it's provided me with material. In mm. other words, if I sat in, you know, quite safely in my job, getting well paid, and you know, sitting there and doing the, the same kind of little routine every day, I had nothing to write about. I had no. literally nothing to write about. Mm. You know, all I could write about is a a man successfully sitting there watching film. You know, and whereas now the very torments, the problems, the confrontations, the, the need for resilience. When mm -hmm. people say no, like J.K. Rowling, when she rejected 36 or 37 times when she... And so all of the... It's like you have to throw yourself into the world, become bruised and be resilient. And they're the things mm -hmm. that give you material to, to write with. Yeah. Um, so the, the comfort zone that I've left was probably the only way I could actually do what I wanted to do. But you just got to know that there is going to be two or three years of, of torment as you do change, you know. And I'm a little bit different than most people in the sense that I'm doing it at a um, a later stage. But, you know... Um, You've had more to let go, though. The more, and more to let go. Mm. Um, in some sense, I probably have a little less to lose. And You know, I imagine that the, the mother or the, the father who tries to change their life and they've got three young children, for instance, you know, and that can be even more kind of challenging for people as well. So each stage of life has different challenges. And, I, and as a writer, I'm actually really interested now in this massive um, population of older people and what are they going to do in their, in their lives, you know? You know, you can't... There's so many times you can go off to Turkey and to Italy for holidays. <laughs> you know, what are you actually going to do? And I've actually seen former journalists, you know, top journalists, doing um, volunteering work around the suburbs i've seen this oh my god you know they're having to find things to do and uh, and i guess i was a bit obsessed with finding something interesting to do i shouldn't yes. say volunteering not interesting yes as well. yes yeah so um how how d one of the things i wanted to ask was how do you now find it putting scripts out there to be critiqued and what have you when the tables are in effect. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Doc? Certainly against the backdrop of everything we've just been talking about, <laughs> of letting go of everything that you know and forming a new part and the resilience aspect. Yeah, it. and it's, it's, you know, I'm having to learn another whole new profession. I think I'm, very, I'm, I'm quite bad at it because I'm quite needy, you know. And, yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I... One of the first challenges that I had when I started writing was that I was used to um, seeing something and responding to it the next day. Someone would say to me, what do you think of the film? And I'd be on radio, I'd be on wherever, or writing my own reviews, and I'd, and I'd have to come up with a response to it. And when I write something now, I kind of, you know, when I first began, I expected people to do the same thing. So I was working with a particular producer, and I'd say, um, right, here's my draft or whatever. And then, you know, two months later, the response comes back, or six weeks later, I think, I'm just tearing my hair out. I'm thinking, oh, my God. Yes. You know? Because I'm very, I was a very quick worker, and even today I'm still very, very quick. I don't, I, I used to, say I'm very quick and boast that I'm very quick. I don't, I still say I'm very quick, but I'm not convinced that that's the right way. <laughs> I'm yes. not boasting that I'm very quick. I just happen to be very quick. Yes. And that may not be a good, and that name might be a good thing either, you know, so I'm having to, to calibrate. So I'm a little bit needy. I'm not so needy. I was needy in the sense of, because I was so uncertain, you know, please tell me that I'm doing something good. You know, yes. I wanted that. Well, give me some feedback. Give me some, some give me some feedback, you know, and, uh, and to some extent, um, I'm still like that, but now I'm not as dependent upon it in the sense that um, if some, I think I sent something to somebody the other day who um, gave me some neg it was negative, but, you know, three years, two or three years ago, that would have like, really killed me. Now I'm much more resilient. I, I'm, and that's part of the, the journey that I've gone through. I'm starting to understand that I know what's good and what's bad. So I've got a much better... Mm -hmm. Within yourself, within myself, I don't need. I don't need uh, now. It's probably just more professional. I've just got to do the kind of the right mm. steps. So, it's a huge, again, a huge journey for. As I think I was saying to you before, that the very thing that you think would make me a good at being a creative person, being a journalist or something like that, is it's, it's almost the worst thing. I've had to unlearn all of the habits from journalism to become something different, mm. and um, yeah, so it's almost a whole set of. It's not just criticism versus creativity it's a whole approach to um thinking about the world of the professional approach the speed the depth and all of those kinds of things there are things that 
of extremely positive, I think, uh, for me, and they're the things I'm kind of dwelling upon, is that you know more than than creative people, I've been very connected to the to the reception part of creativity. In other words, I've sat in in cinemas and watched films come through and be ignored. I've watched the box office in and out week after week to know what works and doesn't work. So in other words, I'm I'm very much on the side of the, the receiving end. So mm. I've got a I think a good sense of the commercial or what's going to work or what's going to work. Whereas a lot of um, film creative people, especially in Australia, which is a very kind of cosseted Im- industry, it's all, mm. it's all government subsidised. I was going to ask that. Yes. And so you get a lot of creative people who feel as though they should be paid for their for their for who, for spilling who they are onto the screen, their particular vision. And I don't really have that. You know, that's the one thing that I'm different from. I think many many writers is that I'm more with the receiving end of it. I, I understand the commercial aspect of film. And and I think what what I think if I've got any strength, I think it's the way I'm interested in the some sense of quality or or insight into the, in, into the human nature, into humanity, the world, marrying some sort of entertaining storyline. And I think that that's what I'm trying to do as a as a creative person. Mm. And that's probably just you know through many years of watching films. Um, many years of developing my own kind of world view and then somehow learning to bring them together. And that's where, instead of just giving you a world view without that, without the the, the, yeah. the vessel that's interesting, that's just completely boring. If I start telling you about my childhood and you, <laughs> you say, stop boring me. Yeah. But if I tell you about my childhood and say, well, it's just like being in a gang and we did that, in other words, then, I, then you would have the metaphor that would interest yeah. you. And it's that bringing the, the metaphor together and that's that's the challenge I think of working inside of popular culture. Hmm. It's interesting you say about Austra- many, much of Australian film being government. It's all government funded. Government funded. Um, because I don't know. Maybe because I look at things. You know, former business consultant Bryn looks at things and go, well, if it's not government f- funded, then the the outcomes are quite clear, as in you want to make a film that entertains or impacts to such a level that you get the number of people in the cinema that you make money to, at the very least, cover the cost of the film, if not make some profit on it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because this is a business entity. It's, it's not a business. It's, yeah. it's an art form. Yeah. But, weird, isn't it? but then if you have government, if it's government funded, then you're, you're ticking a whole number of agendas. Absolutely. Then. And you know, and the box office is almost the last of them. Y- yes. <laughs> yes. And so, therefore, yeah. you know, I can. Mm. I mean, I, I don't know so much about this in in great depth, but you know, it could almost be well. You know, we need to have this level of inclusivity. We need to have this, and we need to have that, and we need to have a number of things. All well, the there. boxes have to be ticked, and uh, in, indeed, yes, indeed. And so, and and also, just, I think. Um, it's both that there's that what I would call as the box ticking aspect of it, but I think there's also another aspect, and that is the um, this you know once they anoint somebody, they tend to they can express more of who they actually are, and I think that's I'm, that it's something I'm coming to more awareness of, is that rather than actually keeping that kind of individual aspect to what I would call the underneath of the film, the subtext yeah. that becomes the set the text. And so it doesn't have that lovely sort of metaphoric dimension that I think good Hollywood films have, or the better Hollywood films. It's where it's where you're operating at two levels. It's where you're sort of telling a great story about this, and then underneath something else is going on. I think yes, our films the tend front to, of house and the back of house. The house. Yeah, I think in our films they tend to be a bit sort of always, you know, the back of house has made the front of house and can really bore the hell out of people. Yes. And I think it's a real danger. And Australian films have um, really can mm. suffer. We can read down times. And look, um, we're in a very interesting stage at the moment in Australian films. The um, the streaming services have devastated the film industry. It's basically cut it in half. Mm. So half the number of people are going to mo- Australian movies as they once they were seven or eight years ago. Um, government funding staying to dry up a little. We're always complaining about the lack of government money. Um, so there's again this constant battle to keep those public funds going because we wouldn't have a film industry without that sort of initial investment mm. uh, in film so it's a perennial battle in australia between the gov- the private and the public and how they work together it's it's again another whole podcast on itself mm. Mm. the business brain part of me is, is 
mapping it all out and trying to understand and the business that. would see it as a horrible business it's not yeah. really a business it's a it's um you know when when private people invest in films it's more to do with well you're my you're my brother-in-law or something like that you know we, we love you and i'm a rich man and i'll, and I'll, I'll give, give you some money i'll give you a million dollars to do that yeah so it's that kind of personal sort of interest but as sheer profit um but again i think the film industry is also trying to globalize again more and more through netflix so yeah. There are five or six filmmakers here in Perth who now operate at a global level. They're um, they're putting their they they're being funded by Netflix and they're working internationally. So that's another yeah interesting aspect. I still see Netflix originals and Amazon originals. All of those kind of things. And there are people guys in. They've got three or three top filmmakers that are working in that kind of space now. They're not even, you know, they probably don't even. But they are still touching government funding because you've got to remember that uh, when Netflix or Warner Brothers want to make a film. Um, they, it will cost them, say, $20 million in the US, and they say, oh, if we go to make that film in Perth, the government, the, the state government, the federal government will pony up 8 or $10 million. So all of a sudden, then there's all another set of tax rebates and whatever, and they can almost pay nothing for a film. They get a film for nothing, you know, yeah. or they can get a, a $200 million film for $100 million, you know, that kind of thing, mm. and that's happening in Queensland a lot. So. Guy. There's a lot of, you know, Hollywood is going all over the world looking for tax rebates and uh, your taxpayer's dollar is now subsidising Disney, which is interesting, isn't it? So the biggest Ooh, the biggest conglomerate, uh, entertainment conglomerate in the world is receiving tens of millions of dollars of subsidy from the Australian government. Now, there are people who have complained about that. Others say that it creates thousands, tens of thousands of jobs. So that's mm. a kind of a economics versus you know subsidized yeah. industry but that's a debate that goes on with the industry yeah, itself doesn't it? for, you know exposure of australia on a global scale and particularly particular areas particularly here in western australia our film industry is very focused on the regions and it's there for they're putting money into the regions and they want um, to put the, the, the those regions onto the big screen so therefore they're less worried about the box office more that there are it's circ- the trailer is circulated around the world so they can see for instance dirt music the latest tim winter novel and they want to see pretty the northwest um spreading all over the world you know so but do not worry about the box office they're very I'm sure they're very important <laughs> of making it no i i people I, in the box office to watch it i agree with you and it's, it must be sick heartbreaking for filmmakers to go along and watch their films and you know three people in a cinema and there is one at the moment i won't even na- name that film in which it lasts for a week and a half you know it's not an expensive film but there's still a half million dollars of state government money into the mm. film and uh, it's what the government chooses do you want to foster the career of a young director who spends his money then goes off to los angeles do you you know do you foster a film culture you know what these are very deep and wide questions mm. about business meets culture and of course that's why film is interesting because it's not like the arts it's as much a business as it is a, an art form Although what's interesting about Australia is is that they love to talk about the film industry. Uh, there are very few profits that are made, so um, what they should perhaps be talking about it as an arts industry rather than a film industry, even to categorise it, and people have talked about those questions as well. Mm. We shouldn't keep talking about the film industry as if you're making money out of it. Yeah. You know, so. so where do you see the state of um, media, and in particular you know, news journalism, papers, Etc. Mm. in Western Australia at the moment. Wow, it's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? It's reducing down and down and down. I noticed that um, I work for the um, Macquarie Network, so 6PR, so I go once a week and review films there. That's now part of Channel 9. So, uh, so you've got Channel 9 owning one big chunk of the media, you've got Channel 7 owning the New Western, another big chunk. So the, vo- the number of voices is narrowing right down. Um, uh, there's a lot of anger about the current West Australian that I left because of the young editors trying to give you know, much more of a kind of a tabloidy kick. And mm. uh, you know, I noticed that you know on Facebook there's lots of backlash against um, against his um, approach. Um, I it, I've always felt that the old media instead of trying to go down market should have moved a bit more up market because I always felt that reading is um, something that the, the more thoughtful people do. Mm. Hence, some of the big newspapers around the world that are surviving and thriving are like um, the New York Times and the, the New Yorker because they've never gone down market, they're always going up market. And, and funnily enough, they're, they're actually picking up numbers. So again, it's a, um, a, a global battle. But, but even things like television stations are now old media, aren't they? Like the Western, mm. these Channel 7, 
which is, you know, it buys the West Australian as the kind of, not, no, heck, the West actually bought Channel 7 or they merged. Um, but, it, you know, you can't say that television is driving the old media in one level. The West Australian and Channel 7 are, in fact, part of the same kind of old world. Young people are nowhere near these things, as you know. Mm. They don't go anywhere near. So newspapers are two generations away, you know. The the uh, the 50-year-olds are not reading it and their children are not reading it. The only people who are reading the West Australian are now my 90-year-old um, you know, father, for instance. <laughs> so he still reads the paper. And so... Uh, and now online, and it, as you say, it's a turbulent world. Mm. I'm not quite sure where things are going to go. I was going to ask that. Where? I've got no idea. You know, I've, I've become a heavy user of Facebook uh, for advertising things that I'm doing, like a thing called Movies with Mark, which we do once a month. And that's you know, we've got I've got hundreds of followers, and that that's how I'm advertising. And I'm not going through newspapers anymore. Yeah, there's no space, and and and. You wouldn't even reach people anyway. So that's the other problem: is how do you even reach the people that you want to reach? And and that's and and it's something that I did work a bit in that world of content creation when I left the West. We were creating videos and that kind of thing for mm. a particular company, and you know they're constantly trying to work out how do you reach people. The advertising industry has dried up and died. No one's there anymore. How do you yeah. reach people? The Facebook experts are, are forcing it. Yeah, you can. What well, you can specify age sex location you know through facebook ads and instagram ads and mm -hmm. you know everybody's on their phones scrounging away and bang there it is maybe maybe what's going to shine through uh Bryn, is quality i'm kind of keep attaching myself to that, that mm. in a world of an ocean of content people are just you know you want to read six things a week or watch six mm. things five things a week you're not going to worry with rubbish so um, I keep saying to people, it's safe in the film industry. Australia used to churn out dozens and dozens of movies every year and they'd naturally find the way in the cinema. They make a couple of million dollars. That's gone completely mm. because people don't want to watch crap. You mm. know? There's no way you can release crappy movies. that you know within, They actually have to be really good. They have to um, hit a particular kind of demographic. You have to be very, very astute. And I do think that people can reach audiences be it through um, journalism through mm. entertainment but you just have to be really good and really targeted and and there's no more room for slackers anymore you know, yeah. you've got to be really on the, money. on the money you need to be smart you need to tell stories better you just can't be you can't be bad at things anymore you know mm. i just think that the, the lazy days of media have gone completely you have to be yeah. really on on song to reach people Mm. You have to write the better book. You have to write that. I'm not saying they're the best, but they they've obviously got to have some combination of intelligence and commercial good sense. And I think the film industry, for instance, probably needs to start producing less and less and make um, better and better stuff and spend more money on it. So there's different mechanisms for reaching audiences. Mm. And once those things are good, and once they've got the right actors in it, then the media starts to becoming interested in that kind of thing. You just can't put anything on and then expect the media because the media's not there anymore they're not many of them left anymore so how do no. you you need to create something that people the people and the channels are not necessarily what they were and you've got to create content that um really hits the mark and 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 yeah it may be cheap it may be expensive but just something about that content's got to really compel people i think mm. you know what does the uh next two to three years look like for yourself well, as I say, when I first left the West Australian, I was I was dabbling everywhere. I was you know a bit frantic. I was working in the corporate world. I was kept a bit of journalism going. I um, and started doing some creative writing. So I was kind of all over the shop, and that's because I was a bit nervous about you know, jack of all trades, jack of all yeah. trades, and you know, and 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 I wasn't and I was writing. I wasn't focusing, and I kind of paused. and And I realised my age. You know, I'm not going to start another career. <laughs> so why not? And I think I'm actually easing into accepting that the, that the creative life is where I want to be now. I'm saying, starting to really enjoy it, actually. I'm starting to relax into it a little bit more. Mm. I'm starting to get a bit more confident. Allow it. Just allow it to happen a little bit more, not to be quite so urgent, you know. Quick look at my stuff, and I've got to get this made, or I've got to do that. So I've, I've, I've gained a lot more kind of calm in how I'm doing. I think it's going to come better now. Um, and I'm, I'm also... Inter I'm not that worried so much about... I'm starting to lose... Even though I'm doing a lot of public work at the moment, I'm doing a lot of Q and A's and that kind of thing publicly. But they're not, they're not. I don't feel quite as compelled to have my name out there as I once did. I now need to just allow that part of me 
I'm hoping for the old me now to fully recede into, into, into history a little bit. So mm. this is a good show for me to be doing. It's kind of urging me to allow that to sort of, you know, drift away. I don't think it needs to be, um, you know, I'm really quite enjoying doing Q&As, you know, much what you're doing here. I'll sit down in front of a stage, we'll watch a movie. I mm. did Ben Elton recently and uh, and we'll talk for a half an hour after a film and the audience will engage. And that's not bad. So I'm quite enjoying that. I did... Mm. Does it re- if you say anything like what I do here, then it's you get a real sense of actual connection to the person who wrote it, created it. And then you can really understand the whole human journey behind In- Indeed. It all. And I think what I'm finding is that when I'm talking to people now, whereas I was a bit of a shallow film critic now, I've tried to do it myself. I know the problems. I know the, the agonies there's going through. And I can just see the look in the eyes of uh, directors and writers and actors that they know that I know what they're going through. <laughs> yeah. And there's a particular kind of connection. I'm starting yeah. to really feel that with, you know, people are, my Q&As are getting, I think, better and better. I mean, I don't want to boast too much about them, but they're, and I, I don't think it's because I'm getting any more intelligent. It's that I think that I'm getting a deeper empathy with what people are going through. I'm asking them, you know, so what's it like when, you, when you're stuck with a script in the third draft and where did you go there? And I recently did that at the Cine Fest Isles and, and you know, and I had to Brian Brown recently, and and he they sense that I, we're going. Well, I'm on a parallel journey with them, so I'm a little bit unusual in a sense. I'm like the um, the the creative person that's also still a little bit of a journalist. Like I'm I'm doing it in the same time I'm talking about doing it, like I'm doing mm. today. And so, yeah. and and that's a, it's kind of a bit weird. And I I probably now need to forget about reflecting upon it but I'm a bit sort of that kind of I'm doing it and thinking about it at the same time as I'm doing it which is not a terrible thing because to some extent the trauma that I'm going through and the trauma they use that word <laughs> traumatic the, the journey that I'm on is in fact the journey of some of the characters in my stories so mm. at one level I'm, I'm quite I'm, I'm quite enjoying living out my own little personal arc because then I'm able to then apply it to the very same people because mm. No, life's problems really boil themselves down to um, uh, to a couple of things, and whether you're a writer or whether you're a gardener or whether you're a butcher, you're really dealing with similar kinds of things. Yep. There's something that I learned that really um, excited me in um, script writing terms. I was reading a book about it quite recently, and it's really sort of hit me hard. Is that a character? This guy was saying that um, a really interesting character in a movie is when somebody has got a problem, and they solve that problem with another problem. Mm-hmm. And I love that, and it's 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 like light bulb moment for me because characters do that all the time. For instance, um, one of my favourite films is the film Tootsie, with Dustin Hoffman. Yep. And he's a, about an actor who can't get work because he's too much of a perfection. He's a bit of an asshole, and uh, what he does, uh, his agent says to him, "No one will hire you. You're terrible. You're dreadful. No one will hire you." And he looks at him, and they cut. And the next thing, he's walking down the street dressed as a woman. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and so he solved the problem of not getting a job by landing himself with an even bigger problem, having to go to work <laughs> dressed in a dress every day, and and that's a and we're all a bit like that. We solve problems. You know, I left journalism because I wanted to be a writer, that without realizing that being a writer, a creative writer, is an even bigger problem than the problem that I left. Yep, and I think that's what life is. We solve problems with problems. And some people sink and some people swim and those who swim are the ones that are highly successful because mm. they just keep creating problems for themselves and they're solving more problems. And in order to solve those problems, they're using incredible ingenuity, engineering ingenuity. You know, the mm. guy, the Martian did the same thing, created ingenuity, personal relationship in ingenuity. How do you deal with people? And so if you give yourself problems, most people don't give themselves problems. They avoid problems. Yes. But those people who give themselves problems are the people I really admire. He says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, you know, Fitzcarraldo, I'm going to drag a boat across the South America. I'm going to climb a mountain. I'm going to, you know, win that woman who, who hates me. Yeah. Or I'm going to, and in my case, I want to, I'm going to write that script even though I can't write. It's like, um, I love those movies and we're going to do this. Impossible goals, I've heard them called before because the the version of you at this point in time is not capable of doing that. No. But the person, the, the version of you that you will become, which will achieve that, is yeah. quite exciting. And to some extent, I think I thought I could do it better when I started this a couple of years ago. I thought, oh, look, I'll do that easily. 
and I did it quite easily, but I didn't do it. It was like I, I, did, uh, well. I did. It's like, it's like um, you know, I go to the gym and, uh, you know, I, I think I'm lifting 200 k's, and all I'm lifting is, you know, whatever, 80 k's or 70 k's. In other words, I did something, but it yeah. wasn't much of a feat that what I did. I set the bar so low that I achieved it, and it was wrong, you know. Yeah. And now I can see that the bar is actually here, so I've got to slow down and get to that bar. But once you get there, I think that the the journey is extraordinary. You know, the skills that you need to get to that point. It's like mm. learning a language or doing something. So I'm really, um, and, and I love the idea of older people setting themselves goals. Cause I think that that's mm. what older people don't do. They don't set themselves goals. They find the easiest route. And I've got several friends of mine in my life and I don't admire them because don't. They, they never test themselves. Yes. They never try anything. They And I love people who step onto stage and, and speak in front of a camera when they should, you know, or they've got stage fright or something. I love when people, it's the old go out of your comfort zone. Yes. You know, whether physically, mentally, intellectually, spiritually or whatever. I think that's where human growth occurs and what keeps you, it, it's, it's stressful, but I think once you've done it, but I think there's even greater stress event. I think a smart person who doesn't challenge themselves will live through incredible stress. It'll become a kind of a psychosis yes. as well. And I think I had a bit of that when I was in journalism. I was very competent. I was good at it and I was going and doing it very easily. But I think something was building up inside of me. I'm now in a space where I'm permanently stressed. But, <laughs> but it's a, bit of, a different way. <laughs> in a different way. And, and I think that's what I've learned to come to terms with is, you know, that, um, you know, um, and, and, and I'm, it's not high risk for me because I'm sort of, in my later years and you know i've achieved in you know, a certain kind of financial stability and all that kind of thing but um but still it's a, it's a stress now for uh, reputation for mm. can i really do this and all of that kind of thing so. so what have you learned about yourself across this journey what have i learned oh tons of things you know i've got a terrible character just sort of. <laughs> And I think what's, you know, one of, one of the things that's really interesting, Bryn, is that when, and I, I keep framing things in, in terms of screenwriting, but uh, there's a very good script writing teacher who um, says that um, a character in a movie um, is, when he has a flaw, a character has flaws, and the most interesting flaws characters have got is when the very good thing about themselves, or the thing that they do well, is just taken one step too far. You know, the perfectionist or whatever. Yes. And I'm like that. I'm an enthusiast, but I'm too enthusiastic. I, I chase after things. I go too fast. I, so all the all of my flaws come are just all the, the best, best my best qualities taken one step too far. <laughs> and I find that to be really net. And so, again, I, I, that's me, I'm my character. So I, you know, I kept excoriating myself. Oh, I don't do that, don't do that. But, but in many ways, they're the very things that, define who you are they're the things that um make you different from somebody else so mm. i'm becoming a little less afraid of my my enthusiasms now i've just got to be careful where i land them a little bit i'll keep them to myself or <laughs> my long-suffering wife uh, she she encounters my enthusiasms um so it's a question of yeah knowing your your strength and your weakness but but knowing that they're the same thing Mm. Your strengths are your weaknesses. Your weaknesses are your strengths. They're exactly the same thing. And it's just implying them. So I think that once you get to a certain age, Bryn, is that you're, you're like a full suitcase, aren't you? You've got so much of life. You've got so much experience. You've got so much of everything. And so when it comes to doing something, you're, you're almost too much. You know, when you get a, a 24-year-old starting out, they're not very much at all. They, mm. You know, the boss says do this and they go and do that. You know, but a boss telling... Um, you know, someone of my age or your age to do something, you, you, it's, it's a bit sort of like, you know, what part of it do you want? I've yes. Got, you know, I can see it from lots of different angles and perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I can give you that. I can give you that and whatever. And so that's why I think employees, employers are, are, are afraid of older employees, not because they're no good at something, because they're too damn good at something. Mm. And in fact, if I, was, if I was employing, you know, in a small office situation where you can only afford to have three people, you know, we get three young people who can do one little thing. You go and get someone that's been, has been a, running a business or been doing something for 40, 30, 40 years. You've got those skills plus another 50 other skills. Yes. So if you can if you can stand that, that crazy older person like me, you'll get value out of them like, like, yeah. nobody, like nobody. Like a Swiss business. army knife with full of tools. They're full of tools, <laughs> but, they're, but they're dangerous because they're full of tools. They're yeah, because like, they're oh, sharp. Because they're sharp. And yeah, so I, I mean, that's a, a lesson I'd try to, you know, 
you know, in in my later years, is the culture is what wants to discard older people. But my God, I think there's so much value in older people. Mm. If older people keep themselves on the pulse of culture, business, or whatever, they can be incredibly valuable. You know, they're they're just um, it's just that they've got to um, yeah. I, I mean, as I keep saying, I love nothing better than some cranky old people when they sort of... You know, I'd seen them on TV on Q&A and things like that. I just watch, love watching people like Germaine Greer talking to younger people. You can just see she's about to explode in the moment because she's got so much intellect. Yes. So solid in her opinion. So, mm. And so, you know, and that's part of my journey, I think, is, is, is it, it's, it is a journey of self-discovery. I've had a three-year journey of self-discovery, one of what parts for me to reject, what part to accept understanding that you know you can't reject you know the bad stuff they've got to, you've got to incorporate into the good stuff you just got to and maybe it's a question of um i think it's self-knowledge isn't it it's really yeah. it's just knowing it's knowing when to step it's it's pulling back it's almost putting yourself on a shelf and knowing who you are and then guiding yourself because you've got to be just careful and carefully guided i think in in the way in which mm. you deal with the world and the choices that you make uh, but again, I'm only talking. I'm talking about these mainly in, in the kind of creative sphere. Most people in my age just gently retire, Bryn. Mm, not you. <laughs> no. um, how do you keep? Do you have any sort of daily routines? Keep yourself grounded nowadays? Yeah. Look, one one of the pleasures of not being a full time worker now is I can hit the gym a little bit more. I've always been very physical. I've always enjoyed mm. the gym. So okay, about three years ago, I saw Floyd Mayweather on TV uh, on the video YouTube skipping. I said, "Oh, I can do that." And so I set myself the task to skip like Floyd. And so skip like Floyd. Skip like Floyd. And it's been a great exercise actually because it's got that sort of um, skill level as well. It's um, mm. it's interesting and fun. And uh, and so I became the skipping man. I also jumping on boxes and uh, and now I've started taking up push-ups so yeah I'm trying to do that sort of um load bearing I do a lot of weight lifting and stuff so exercise in general has been my my thing and and I've just skill-based exercise so yeah and I'd recommend that for anyone that's older so you know you wither away and uh, mm. I, th- I think I tend to see um body you know any any sort of exercise is the same it's like an intellectual thing you know in other words if you don't it's the old, you know, don't use it, you lose it. In other words, you, in the same way as I'm sort of expanding my brain by testing myself in new areas like writing, the body is the same thing. So skipping is not something that, you know, people of my age tend to do, but I um, I see it as a challenge. I, I like challenges. That's another aspect of it. Mm. I'm a bit of a, uh, um, I remember when I was a kid at, um, uh, at the primary school, um, uh, I used to, I wanted to do high jumping, I think. I was in the primary school and, and I just sat there and just watched and watched these older kids do it. And, I'd, and they'd all go home and in the dark I would do it. I, something I, If I saw something, I would just keep doing it until I could actually do it. When do I first it. started skipping, oh my God, I was whipping myself. My arms were bleeding, my legs <laughs> were bleeding. But I kept doing it. I was that, that dogged sort of um, person. I am a very dogged individual. Mm. I, if I can't do something, I'll make sure I do it. And by the time I finish doing it, I'll do it with such sort of um, finesse. People think I'm a natural at it, but I'm not natural at all. It's like writing. Mm. I'm not natural at anything. I don't have any natural skills whatsoever. Mm. But I'm very good at mimicking and copying and then making it look as though I'm completely natural at doing that. And that's from physical stuff to written stuff to mm. whatever. So I'm, I'm a real studier of um uh, you know working it out slowing it down on slow motion watching how floyd skips and there's make sure i can yeah. do that sort of thing and so yeah that kind of matches my whole yeah per, it's a bit of both success together. leaves clues yeah yeah so i really enjoy doing that but i yeah so going ahead i want to i want to get you know swimming i know you're a great swimmer that's what i want to get into that's the mm. the great one for the old and not too much stress on the body no, no yeah you'll be off to a rock nest in no time <laughs> no. Okay. um last couple of questions What's Mark grateful for? I think, I think my wife Isabel. I married very young, and you know, it kind of just plunged into it. And she's come from a Spanish background, and she was very interesting because she was watching foreign language movies when I did barely knew what they were. So she was very advanced. She comes from a very interesting migrant background with a very interesting father who was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War. So. And in, in, in the last three years, we've spent a lot of time together that I didn't spend as much. And as I sit down and write, you know, she's got so much, so many good ideas and insights. I sit there and I'm like, oh my God, she's, uh, 
and she's been watching movies for me for 30, 40 years. We've been watching movies together, you know, on and, and she, I hadn't realised how much she's actually absorbed. Right. And she's also a nurse, so she comes, got tremendous empathy and she's interested in things like cooking and whatever. And so I use her as a great resource and I'm such an idiot about most of the world. One thing that, uh, as a film critic for so many years watching cinema, I, I learnt nothing. I, I sort of I'm just watching movies. But she was out <laughs> in the world nursing doing stuff and whatever yes. and she's observant you know she's got all the all the qualities that i don't have she has so i use her as a great resource i say what do you think of that what happens there and she'll and she'll get on and she'll actually have, she's got all the kind of grounded qualities and then but she's got these little moments of what i would call just sheer artistic inspiration you know and she gives me ideas all the time so i'm really it's i've i've come to i mean it's a terrible thing to admit on on the podcast but i've actually come to respect the the depth and intelligence of my own my own wife and and i I must admit that i had probably one of those um men that have looked away from family to other people thinking oh he's bright and she's bright and whatever without really my own the resource in my own garden to some extent you know and that's what i um yeah, I've really appreciated that, yeah. Well, one of the last questions that I asked all my guests is, um, if you could take a little nugget, hmm. uh, Mark's little nugget, and put it into the collective consciousness so everybody just gets it, what would that be? Mm, what a hard and interesting question. What insight into the world. Um, what I've, as a... I'm becoming much more of a humanist as I get older. Human frailty. I really, you Is know, that what you mean by humanist. No? Humanist, yeah. I mean, in understanding that, you know, as I the older I get, the more I realise how flawed we are as individuals. How not flawed, but how frail we all are. That I, I don't judge. When I when I was fifteen, I was the most judgmental person in the world. I was. T- Terrible, terrible judge. I would judge this person, that person. You know, I was terrible judging. Then I become a critic, and I was judgy as well. Yeah. And and but deep down, I'm a really, and I and I think I'm part of that baby boomer generation that I've maintained that that sort of. Um, I, I mean, that's becoming more and more for me is is that that people are flawed, and I'm much more forgiving of people. I don't I don't judge people much anymore. Occasionally, you have to judge. You know, someone's, you know. Uh, uh, needs a good kicking but you know in general i'm really i'm just and 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 it's i think it's it's an interesting quality to have at a time of, of really high judgment you know you go onto the onto the internet now and the next person is oh, cancelled yeah. or judged or whatever and and i understand human frailty and, and that comes from a long life i think you know you've made mistakes you've you've had to lie when you shouldn't be lying and all of those sorts of things and and i and i understand so i really believe you know don't judge too quickly you know that's the one that i you know just take a second look at every situation and there's a one of the the great the great script writing scholar again i keep going back to film books a guy called robert mckee he believes that every um film every scene in a movie every line of dialogue has one kind of idea in it and he says that a character looks at another character or looks into the world and they make a judgment then they look a little bit closer and they see what they saw is completely and utterly wrong. Mm. You know, they they look in like in a movie, a long shot. You see somebody, um, maybe a person of color, trying to get into a car, and you think they're robbing the car, but they look a bit closer and they they just lost their keys or something like that. Yes. And I think that's a kind of a principle I apply to all of life: is that never make a judgment from the outside. Just wait a little bit, pause, and see what really goes on. And that's the, the you know, I'm going to be applying that to my, to my writing, and to to people in general and the world in general. Just mm. don't judge too quickly. Just a, a bigger heart. Mm. Mark, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you today. <laughs> Thanks, Bryn. It's been great to, um, yeah, just mm. listen to the breadth of experience that you. Well, you caught me on a journey, Bryn, and I, <laughs> it's a self-reflexive journey, and I probably. Uh, gone on far too much but i'm actually well, sort of thinking out loud a lot of it's it's creative stuff and it's just winding through my head so you've got me in a, at a particular moment in time well that's probably the most opportune moment in time for this podcast as you know transition nearly all of the people that come onto this podcast are in some point before during or after some sort of transition and mm. and and part of um part of the the impact that I would like these podcasts to have is to normalise 
the discussion around the journey yeah. of transition and complexity and contradiction Absolutely. that is the human existence. Yeah. It's not necessarily the linear path that we were sold when we were kids and it was handed down to us through school and yeah. parents or parents aspirations and 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 society around us it's 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 complex and it's contradictory and some days it makes sense and then the next day the same thing just makes no bloody sense whatsoever and there are transitions and i find <clears throat> you know the the I was saying to you beforehand, I've started to have more conversations with people about people holding on to stories for much mm. longer than they possibly needed yeah. to for the shelf life. People who have, like yourself, have been in a career for 20 years, which served you so well for such you a did, period yeah. of time. But now it's time, you know, you're looking back and see and, and saying fair, from farewell to that period. Of it's time. taken a long time and I was probably yeah. too attached to it. And, and I'm saying to, it's taken me two or three years to forget all about it I don't really you know it's saying to it, it's still there but it's, I'm just gradually pushing and pushing it and, away and letting and it go letting it go and yeah. so yeah I, I think for the purposes of WA Real I've hit you right at the right spot no yeah indeed you have one of my very famous favourite film directors a Frenchman called Jean-Luc Godard when he was casting movies he always wanted to find an actor who was always either on the way up an actor was on the way down. He wanted to get people in transition. He just didn't want that locked in position. Yes. And I, was, I, yeah, could, I can understand that, that sense of, I love people in transition. You know, I love to talk to people like that. I, you know, I just love, when I find people who are just stuck and not so much stuck, but are, are refusing, I don't find them as interesting. I've always been drawn to, mm. to troubled people because they're just, they're just, they're troubled. Right? Yeah. I, I like that sense of, you know, people with dreams and it, it's, it can be quite, awful because sometimes you can just see they're not going to find it you know they that the you know the young woman wants to be a singer or something like that and, and I, I love it i'm very drawn to it but i feel very uh, uh say protective of them i feel as though you know i've got to protect you from that sort of thing you know um and so yeah it's uh, the human condition Bryn. indeed mark thank you very much for your time thanks Bryn. See you.